I have to defer with Mr. Leong. I do not intend to get into a, a debate on figures with him. If he thinks that me and all my MOF officers know less about revenues than him, that's his. I mean, you are entitled to take that view. Somehow, when the opposition asks for questions about revenue and expenditure projections, these are red herrings. You know, after 25 years of public service, I know it's almost impossible for the government to do anything that pleases everyone all of the time. Both the WP and PSP have suggested spending more from reserves to meet our rising expenditure. It is tempting to turn to our reserves each time we need more funds, but is this the right thing to do? The leader of the opposition, Mr. Pritam Singh, has highlighted that the reserves rules were amended in the past, so we can easily amend them again now, for example, to adjust the percentage we use from the NIRC. We should not, at the first sign of need, push for changes in the rules just to take the easy way out and to avoid having to raise taxes to meet our growing, recurring expenditure needs. That would not be the responsible thing to do. So there is clearly a structural funding gap as our spending needs rise. We have shared extensively about our needs and plans and will continue to put out more information where necessary. But I can't help but feel that the persistent requests for more information are red herrings. They are distractions from the key problem at hand. Unfortunately, both the WP and PSP paint a false, distorted and misleading picture about our reserves, that these are being accumulated at the expense of the current generation. That is not so. They have assumed that the present rules result in an accumulation of more reserves than is necessary. But that is not the case. Our reserves are growing, but the size of our economy, the challenges we face, and the complexity of needs are growing even faster. I've already explained that the NIRC has provided about 3.5% of GDP to the annual budget on average in the last five years, and that going forward, we expect this NIRC stream to continue to keep pace with economic growth. I don't think it's an allusion to, uh, it's an accurate uh, reflection to say that first instance you look and turn to the reserves. That's not true. Somehow when the opposition asks for questions about revenue and expenditure projections, these are red herrings. But it can't be so. Because I, as I mentioned in my budget speech, um, it's something that many jurisdictions do. I mean, Hong Kong has a medium range forecast um, right up to fiscal year 2026, 2027, and they've got assumptions. Of course, you're projecting into the future, so it can't be perfect, and I think people will give the government buffer and leeway for that. On projections and, and numbers and data, I, I accept Mr. Singh's point. Um, I, I was not attempting to characterize it unfairly. I was just sharing my feelings about these repeated requests for information as perhaps distracting us from the real issues. But I accept Mr. Singh's clarification and I assure him, you have my commitment that we will continue to put out more information as much as possible in order to provide for more informed debates. From what I've heard in this debate, the basic position of the WP and the PSP is that we can close the funding gap without having to raise the GST. How? By making various groups pay more. Make the wealthy pay more. Make large companies pay more. Let future generations pay more. Anything but GST increase. Even though I have already explained the GST increase in Singapore does not hurt the poor. I can understand why they think this, these alternatives are politically more attractive options to offer, but I'm afraid they are too simplistic and divisive and will end up creating more problems for our society. And let me explain. The bottom line is that we cannot sustain a tax system where the bulk or all of the burden is borne by a small group of people at the top end. It will not be possible to hold our society together if only a small group of people 
are required to pay more taxes all the time, while the rest simply get to piggyback on their contributions to enjoy more benefits. And that's why having a broad-based tax like the GST is so vital. It makes a direct link between our demands as voters and our responsibilities as citizens. Break that link and we encourage irresponsible lobbying and playing to the gallery. Divide the taxpayers into three groups. Top 20%, the middle class who will not get permanent vouchers, and those taxpayers who will get permanent vouchers. What is, how is the $3 billion or $3.5 billion additional GST is going to spread over these three groups? If you have to choose between a 2% GST hike and a 3 to 4% personal income tax hike on the top 10%, they will yield about the same amount of revenue. Would you still choose the GST 2% hike? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, let me answer the second question first because it's quite straightforward. The sums don't add up, Mr. Leong. The sums don't add up. A 2 to 3 percent percentage point increase in the top personal income tax rate will never get anywhere close to the revenue we get from a 2 percent increase in GST. But as I've repeatedly said, the objections to GST on the basis that it hurts the poor are completely unfounded. You may disagree with the GST, fine, but do not use that as a reason for disagreeing with GST. There is no basis for that in Singapore. So stop pretending that this is the reason. On the first question, impact of the middle class, I, I know what you're trying to do with your computations, um, but I have shown in my chart and in my speech a different way of showing it, which is the share of GST paid by the different groups. And you can see from that, the chart, the chart is self-explanatory. It shows in that effective rate chart where you saw when we stacked up the effective GST rate and we showed the increase in GST to 9%, that extra burden is all borne by the upper income deciles, upper middle and top end. Minister, I think you didn't answer my question. After all, someone have to pay for the $3 billion or $3.5 billion GST. So I'm asking you, what is the tax burden on the different groups of Singaporeans? You cannot say there's no increase in tax burden. Secondly, on the income tax, can I ask the, uh, 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 the minister then, what is the total taxable income attributable to the top 10%? 10%? I can tell you that 4%, 3% increase in the income tax on the top 10% will yield $3 billion. And if you are unable to accept facts which I have put out and you say that that's wrong, I don't know how to debate any further. Because then what are we debating about? You are unable even to accept an authoritative fact from the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, sir, in every budget, we discuss and debate the design of policy parameters or schemes in monetary terms. But the budget is much more than that. It reflects something deeper, our ethos and our values. It's an expression of our shared compact to tackle our challenges to ta together, to never stop thinking of tomorrow, and to never cease building a better Singapore. All this boils down to trust. In this budget, I've set out plainly the challenges and also the opportunities ahead of us and explained why we need to move on difficult measures like the GST increase. It is not a popular thing for me to do, certainly not for my first budget as finance minister, but I have a responsibility to do what's right and what's in the best interest of all Singaporeans. Not what's politically expedient now, but will store up problems for the future. I am convinced that the measures in the budget are necessary and will put us in a stronger position to strengthen the self-reinforcing system of trust we have now 
and to ensure that every citizen contributes their fair share to building our common enterprise, which is Singapore.